In the late autumn of 1942, the war had reached a turning point. In just months, the fortunes of Japan have crashed to disaster from a seemingly never-ending catalog of victories. Only months before, thousands of American troops surrendered as the Philippines fell. Thousands of British Empire troops passed into captivity as Japan won a dramatic victory against the Imperial Fortress of Singapore. Japanese power had come to dominate the Western Pacific and Southern Asia. Japanese troops threatened India, the jewel in the crown of the British Empire. With the naval battles of first the Coral Sea, and then, most decisively, Midway, the balance of power in the Pacific moved into America's favor. Now Japan would be forced to react against American attacks. Months after beginning the war with victory after victory, Japan is now on the defensive. In the Arctic Ocean, a sea battle no less vital than that of Midway is fought as convoys carrying supplies to the Soviet Union fight their way through ice, storms and constant German attack. Everywhere the fortune of war is turning. After the last ditch defense of Moscow, Russian counterattacks through the snows of winter have stemmed the tide of German conquest in the east. Hitler has ordered a great offensive. Once more, vast advances are made, and thousands of prisoners are taken. The objective of the Germans is southern Russia, its oil fields and industrial resources. The decisive strategic point is the city of Stalingrad. In the skies of Germany, the first mass bomber raids are begun by the RAF. In one night, 1,000 RAF planes attacked Cologne. In the Mediterranean and North Africa, the Africa Corps stand poised to sweep into Egypt and into the Middle East. The British Empire forces await attack in the desert at El Alamein. They are the last line of defense. The war in the Western Desert was characterized by huge movement, with armies covering vast distances. Successful offensives often grinding to a halt through armies outrunning their supply lines. Early in June, the Africa Corps had thrust deep into Egypt, rolling back the 8th Army once more. The British were now close to defeat. They had prepared defensive positions at a place called El Alamein. Terrain meant that El Alamein was the gateway to Egypt. Defeat here would mean that Rommel could break out to attack Suez and threaten Arabia. As the British troops awaited attack, British bases in Egypt were evacuated. On July 1st, the Africa Corps prepared to smash down the door. They were 100 kilometers from Cairo. Their radio station made a propaganda broadcast. They told the ladies of Cairo to be ready for them tonight. The battle that followed, what was to become known as the First Battle of El Alamein, will be forever the subject of historical debate. Were Rommel's forces completely exhausted and out of supply, or was a brilliant last-ditch defense organized by the British General Auchinleck? The narrowness of the front, the lack of supplies, the well-prepared static defenses resulted in Rommel being stopped. Both sides came to a halt. Churchill saw the campaign in the desert of crucial importance. He believed a defeat for the Axis in the desert would lead to an invasion of Italy and enable a strike at what he called the soft underbelly of the Axis. Churchill constantly gave advice to whichever general commander was in the desert. A succession of officers had failed to meet his expectations. Churchill, thinking Auchinleck not aggressive enough, sacked yet another commander. He appointed a new commander for the 8th Army, William Gott. Gott took his appointment up on the 6th of August. On August 7th, Gott was killed in a plane crash.
there was a hurried search for a replacement, which brought forward a legend of the war. Lieutenant General Bernard Montgomery, a fanatical perfectionist who had studied warfare extensively, was to become the most successful and famous British general of the war. Unlike Rommel, who was an improviser, a quick thinker, Montgomery was called the master of the set piece. He was determined to gain victory at the least cost in life and believed in painstaking planning and preparation, assembling an overwhelming force before any operation, leaving nothing to chance. Montgomery's technical genius was matched by an ability to communicate and inspire the ordinary soldier, instilling incredible self-belief and confidence in those he commanded. Those who served under him came to have complete and utter faith in his leadership. Montgomery's failing was conceit. Other generals, soldiers of Allied armies, came to find him unbearable to work with. Montgomery had an immediate effect, galvanizing the Eighth Army, restoring morale straight away. Warned by good intelligence of Rommel's plans to attack and break through once more, Montgomery made careful preparations for which he was famed, coordinating the attacks by the RAF's Western Desert Air Force and beat off the attack. Montgomery promptly began planning for a long set piece that would win the Desert War. One of Montgomery's greatest obstacles was his opponent, Erwin Rommel. Not just the German general's technical ability, but the legend of the man. In the Western Desert, Rommel had won such stunning victories by unconventional and unpredictable actions. Many British officers thought Rommel unbeatable. The Africa Corps was a small force, a tiny fraction of that deployed against the Soviet Union. Had Rommel's genius been given a small part of the strength allotted to Russia, he would have undoubtedly driven the British from Egypt and possibly have won the war for Germany. As it was, Rommel once more stood at a halt, his advance restricted by a shortage of material for war. A war of extreme mobility had suddenly become fixed with trenches and extensive minefields on both sides. It was a situation for the set-piece planned battle at which Montgomery excelled. On September 23, 1942, Rommel fell ill and returned to Germany. He was absent for one month. All through October, Montgomery built up the 8th Army's strength, planning the Second Battle of El Alamein. A large force of artillery was assembled with huge stocks of ammunition. Every spare tank was put into place. The individual units were trained and trained again into specialist roles. To hide the complex British preparations, diversions and deceptions were made to mislead the Germans. The defenders were taken totally by surprise when the British Empire troops attacked on the night of October 23rd. Rommel was summoned from sick leave to the battle. The battle opened with intense and prolonged artillery barrage. Teams of engineers cleared the dense German minefields. Montgomery appreciated the value of air power and organized closely coordinated air support. The battle lasted 12 days as Montgomery's plan was methodically enacted. German counterattacks were met with heavy air and artillery bombardment. The German counterattack, as Montgomery planned, drew German forces away from where the next British attack was planned. 
1,000 German prisoners were taken. The remainder of the Nazi army fled in retreat across Libya. This second battle of El Alamein lasted 12 days and was just one of any number of battles in the war. But the effect of the British victory was electrifying. For the first time, German forces had been defeated in a strategically decisive confrontation. The German war effort in North Africa would not recover. Churchill was to say, This is not the end. Uh, it is not even the beginning of the end. Uh, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. War brings innovation in weaponry and tactics. One of the most lasting inventions of World War II is not a weapon, but a way of fighting. The war in the desert, in the vast spaces that existed behind the front lines, new types of units were deployed. The British armies formed a group which carved out a special place in military history, the Special Air Service Regiment. The SAS remained unseen to the regular army. It has its origins amongst odd, strange, irregular units, the special boat section of Britain's Royal Marines, sections of the Greek Sacred Regiment, a group of fanatically loyal Greek officers, and free French paratroopers. These embryonic special forces operated in small units deep behind German lines, gathering intelligence, attacking German airfields. The special forces then, as now, were outsiders, full of men who did not fit into the normal military mold. The numbers of the war were slowly turning against Germany as more and more forces came into action against them. On November 8th, in Operation Torch, a combined American and British force made amphibious landings in North Africa, in Morocco, and Algeria. These territories were then French colonies and held by the troops of the collaborationist Vichy regime. The invasion was the first of a series of actions that would, in the end, result in the invasion of France in 1944. The campaign was thought the best way to introduce the inexperienced American army against the Third Reich. 65,000 Americans landed. The overall command of the operation was under the direction of American General Dwight Eisenhower. Amongst the American officers were many men who would later rise to prominence, including Mark Clark and George S. Patton. The campaign involved detailed coordination of the armed forces of different nations and close integration of army, navy and air force. It was not the second front that Stalin had demanded of his Western allies, but it still worked to relieve the pressure on the Russians. The attack increased pressures on Rommel, attacking his rear. The campaign ran into complicated politics of Vichy France, of conflicting loyalties. Some French commanders went over to the Allies, some fiercely resisted. The capture of Algiers cost the lives of 1,400 Americans and 700 French. Some French both refused to surrender and refused to fight. The remains of the French Navy stationed at bases in North Africa chose to scuttle itself. The Axis responded by pouring troops into North Africa. Rommel found the fighting on this second front difficult. The Italians restricting the German freedom to respond and use their great strengths of mobility. The terrain was unlike that of Libya and Western Egypt difficult and unhelpful to mobile warfare. A result of North African landings was an end to the supposed freedom of Vichy France. The German army occupied southern France, bringing their domination to the whole of French territory. Their aim was to protect the country from British and American invasion. The Second Battle of El Alamein and the arrival of the Americans moved the war on North Africa into the end game. Elsewhere in the World War, new campaigns were opening. On August 7, 1942, U.S. forces attacked the Pacific island of Guadalcanal. 
Since the Japanese invasion of the Philippines, the armies of the Japanese Empire and America had not met. The fighting on Guadalcanal, a remote and tiny British colony, part of the Solomon Islands archipelago, was to be lengthy and bloody. 19,000 US Marines and a naval force of three aircraft carriers made the first assault. The aim of the US was to prevent Japanese expansion southwards. The Americans landed unopposed, but the Japanese responded sending a bomber attack and a strong naval force. The threat of air attack forced the US carriers to withdraw and the naval force defeated the US ships. With command of the sea, Japan landed troops on the island. The battle was to drag on for months. The US Marines captured and held the island's airstrip. US construction battalions, CBs, labored under fire to build and maintain the field as operational. As a result, a small US Air Force flew from the island itself. Hand-to-hand -hand close infantry action on the island was matched by a series of powerful naval battles. Over the months, the numbers fighting over the small patch of Earth escalated. At the start of the campaign, in August, the United States landed 10,000 of its intended garrison. The Japanese had just 2,000. By mid-November, 29,000 Americans were opposed by 30,000 Japanese. Mid-November saw a titanic sea battle, what became known as the Battle of Guadalcanal, as a Japanese invasion force with massive reinforcements was intercepted by the US Navy and Air Forces, some taking off from the island's own airfield whilst under fire from massive battleship guns. Two huge Japanese battleships were sunk. American aircraft fought past Japanese defenses and attacked the transport ships. The destruction of Japanese naval superiority in the area was the key to eventual victory on land. Following the battle in mid-November, Japan could only supply its troops by submarine. By December 1st, American forces stood at 40,000, the Japanese 25,000. As 1942 turned to 1943, U.S. forces numbered 50,000 well-supplied troops against dwindling Japanese running out of supplies. At the end of January, the remaining Japanese slipped away, leaving the Americans in command of Guadalcanal. The cost was high to the U.S. A carrier and many smaller ships sunk many other warships severely damaged, and nearly 2,000 died for a small patch of territory. But Guadalcanal was a battle on land to match that of Midway at sea, a defeat from which Japan never fully recovered. The initiative in the war passed to the United States. Ever after, Japan could only react, defending against US attacks. All through 1942, in Burma, the British had been fighting what was to become one of the least known campaigns of the war. The British army that fought in Burma came to call themselves the Forgotten Army. To call the army that fought this war a British army would be wrong. The majority of the soldiers were Indian, but also present were the distinctive native peoples of Burma. The Burmans, the Karens, the Kachins, the Nagas and the Chins, plus Chinese and Gurkhas, and black soldiers from East and West Africa. Terrain determines the nature of warfare. Burma offered a diverse landscape that made for warfare of a dramatically divergent nature. Fighting took place in dense, steaming jungle, in mountains, on wide plains that were suited to tank action, on large rivers, in coastal waters. Burma was used as a shop window for the Japanese concept of anti-colonialism. Eventually, they would declare the country liberated and independent. Following their invasion, the Japanese had swept northward through Burma. Through 1942, the British forces made the longest fighting retreat in British military history. 
1942 turned to 1943, yet another tide of war had reached its furthest point. The Japanese invasion had been halted at the border to India, and the British were once more planning another attack. In August, war returned to mainland Western Europe as a combined force of Canadian, British, American and Free French mounted a raid upon the French Channel port of Dieppe. The aim of the attack was to seize the town and systematically destroy its defences, coastal artillery, a radar station and the German divisional headquarters. The motive for the attack was mostly political. It was to show Stalin that his Western allies were doing something in the West that would force Hitler to withdraw troops from the Eastern Front. The raid was, in part, an experiment to test the defenses of Germany in the West, a preparation for an eventual invasion of liberation. Dieppe was a disaster. Of 6,100 men who started the attack, 4,100 did not return. The bulk of the force were Canadian soldiers. Nearly 1,000 Canadians were killed and 1,500 taken prisoner. Before leaving to take up command in North Africa, General Montgomery had demanded the Dieppe raid be cancelled. He insisted it was poorly planned and doomed to fail. Responsibility passed to Louis Mountbatten, a highly ambitious naval officer, lacking in experience, who had risen quickly, owing not a little to his membership of the British royal family. The raid was reactivated. Churchill was eager to take offensive action and dismissed the objections of the professional soldiers who were pessimistic. Mountbatten's ambition made him keen to make his mark. Fearful of interference by skeptics, Mountbatten shrouded his plans for the raid in excessive secrecy. Officers who should have known, heads of intelligence for all three services, were excluded from the plans. The failure of the raid was due to poor planning and wild over-optimism. The Canadians were eager to taste action for the first time and were not fully trained. There was poor reconnaissance and intelligence. Plans were based on pre-war holiday photos. No one knew exactly what German units awaited them. The RAF could not be persuaded to release heavy bombers from attacks over Germany. The Navy would not risk battleships to provide heavy guns to shell the coast. Admiralty intelligence on the very day of the raid warned that German naval forces operating off the coast would mean that surprise, essential to success, would be impossible. The lack of surprise, the absence of heavy support, meant that the raiding troops rarely left the landing beaches and were slaughtered by the Germans. One destroyer and 33 landing craft were destroyed. The RAF had supplied fighter cover, but lost 106 planes to 48 from the Luftwaffe. The raid is held up as a textbook example of how not to mount such operations. The story of Dieppe displays the classic ingredients of poor planning, poor intelligence, of over-optimism and political interference that contribute to military disaster. The soldiers who died or passed into captivity did not make their sacrifices in vain. Two years later, the Allied armies would return to the northern coast of France and display lessons learned on the beaches of Dieppe to liberate France from occupation. This is a secret film shot in Paris. A camera is hidden in the basket of a bicycle as it weaves through the streets of the German-occupied capital. The territory under occupation by invaders reached its greatest extent in 1942. Vast areas of both Europe, Asia and the Pacific were under the control of foreign armies. 
the experience of occupation, whether harsh or benign, the attitude of the occupied, whether of resistance, acceptance, or open collaboration, varied widely across the different countries, cultures, and societies that endured defeat and subjection. The experience of occupation always asks difficult questions of the present, often creating history that survivors wish to forget. It's too easy for people who've never lived under occupation, never had to answer such questions of the past, to condemn those who acquiesce to their conquerors. French resistance took many forms, differing in degree and type. Resistance could be simple, non-cooperation with the Germans. Resistance could be the sabotage of war work in the factories. Escaped prisoners of war, downed airmen avoiding capture could be aided. Resistance could involve the production of underground media, publishing the truth about the war. Of course, most dangerous was what is most easily imagined to be resistance, guerrilla warfare the attacks upon communications and military facilities, and direct assaults upon the occupiers with ambushes and assassinations. But there were many who were willing to collaborate, many for whom life went on as usual. Prominent among the armed French resistance was the Maquis. The Maquis were usually young Frenchmen who took to France's forests and mountains. The ranks of the Marquis were greatly swelled when Germany, with the collaboration of the Vichy government, introduced the conscription and deportation of labor to work in the German war industry. History gives us a blurred picture. A good number of Marquis simply wished to avoid capture. Others, armed and trained by the British and Americans, were to become formidable enemies of the Germans. In some countries that endured occupation, the war split those societies down existing fracture lines, forcing apart old wounds. Yugoslavia had been swiftly conquered in 1941, its army collapsing before German invasion. The Axis dismembered Yugoslavia. Some areas were annexed by Germany, some areas were occupied by the Italians, some by Hungary, some by Bulgaria and some by Albania. A so-called independent state of Croatia was established. It was a state organized on Nazi lines, and a rump of Serbian territory endured the full force of occupation by the German army. Within these statelets, the many minorities of this corner of Europe took sides. Croatian forces, the paramilitary Ustaz, sided with the Nazis. Resistance forces were divided between Yugoslav nationalists, the remnants of the army called Chetniks, and communist partisans. The Albanians sided with the invaders. Sometimes Chetnik fought alongside communist partisan, against occupier. Sometimes Chetnik and partisan fought each other. Sometimes Chetnik fought alongside the Nazis. Sometimes partisan fought partisan. Sometimes, Chetnik fought Chetnik. Overlaid were endless small groupings and loyalties where resistance fighters merged with bandits. There were no clear battle lines. The relationships and alliances shifted from village to village. During the occupation, 1.2 million Yugoslavs died, most at the hands of other Yugoslavs. The vast spaces of Russia created a different type of resistance. Political activists, Communist Party members, were ordered to stay behind, and together with stragglers from the Red Army, organized a guerrilla campaign against the Germans, attacking lines of communication, assassinating Russians that they thought were collaborating. Partisan bands were typically based in the forests and wildernesses of Russia, the partisans were political as much as military. Stalin wished to show the civilian population that communism could not be eliminated. Stalin aimed to make the Soviet people fear him more than Hitler. Partisans received little support from the civilians, who in many places allied with the Germans to eliminate resistance activity. In some occupied territories, the resistance forces and the population were one and the same. 
In occupied Crete, the German forces fought a continuous and violent war, a population with a long history of fierce resistance to invasion. British officers, often classical scholars, were able to melt into the population and organize the fighting. The population bore the reprisals, the massacres, as part of war. At the other end of the spectrum, some states preserved civilian lives and the structure of their society by simply accommodating the occupiers. Denmark geared itself to supporting the German war effort and in return retained Danish control over much of the administration of German affairs. The amphibious operation by the U.S. Marines in the Pacific is one of the iconic images of the Second World War. The taking of islands, rolling back Japanese conquests step by step, island by island, beach by beach, was the major feature of U.S. strategy. The aim to establish bases close enough to the Japanese home islands that would enable both a strategic bomber offensive and an eventual invasion. The amphibious attack with Marines storming ashore a beach with support from carrier aircraft and the heavy guns of battleships, then to slowly, painfully drive tenacious Japanese from prepared positions, was but one side of the U.S. strategy. Second was an offensive by U.S. submarines. Japan had to transport huge numbers of troops, vast quantities of arms, ammunition, aircraft, food, and all the materials of war needed to capture and hold the Pacific Island territories. The USA declared unrestricted submarine warfare against Japan, and until the end of the war, mounted an ever tighter grip that amounted, in the end, to a total blockade. The Japanese Navy stressed decisive action and thought convoy escort degrading, even dishonorable. American submarines were technically the best, their radar far ahead of that used by Japan, and the captains highly aggressive. The eventual result was the American submarine force was to do what Germany's U-boats failed to do. In 1942, war had reached a turning point in North Africa at El Alamein and in the Pacific at Midway. In Russia, the decisive battle of the European War, one of the crucial events in the timeline of the 20th century, was coming to pass at Stalingrad. Stalingrad was a Russian city that stood at the edge of Asia. Hitler had expected that his renewed offensive would sweep into southern Russia and the Ukraine. It was an offensive to take hold of Russia's great natural wealth. Wheat fields, mines, factories and oil fields. He intended to seize these lands and then to build what he called a Great East Wall. The invasion had already captured half of the Soviet Union's grain, two-thirds of its coal, iron and aluminum. Nearly half of the USSR's population was under occupation. To capture the oil of the communists could be the final blow that would render Bolshevism impotent. The Germans believed that victory at Stalingrad would complete the destruction of the Soviet forces, causing all to collapse. The task given to the German armies was not one soldier's relish. Armies used to maneuvering in open country to wars of vast advances were asked to capture a large city, street by street. For Stalin, the Battle of Stalingrad was of central importance. The military and strategic importance of the city compounded by the political damage that the loss of the city, carrying the dictator's name, would bring. On September 30th, the Germans held two-thirds of Stalingrad. Hitler broadcast to the world that the city would fall. Stalin decided that the city was to be held at any cost. Russian reinforcements were poured into the city. The Soviets deployed special units of devoted communists behind their lines. Their task was to shoot any Russian deserting. Many thousands of Russians were ruthlessly killed by their own side in this way. 
The thrust of Stalingrad had produced a great dent in the front line between the two armies, with Stalingrad at the apex. To reinforce the attack on the city, elite German troops were withdrawn from the sides of that dent. Their places were taken by weaker Romanian, Hungarian, and Italian units. It was to be a crucial mistake by the Germans. The fighting was street by street, room by room, house by house. The front line, a doorway, a corridor, a ceiling. The lines of supply, staircases, sewers, and chimneys. The Germans ground the Soviets back and back, and eventually, by November 19th, had encircled the city completely. But on that same day, a massive Russian counterattack began. The Romanian armies protecting the Germans collapsed, and seven days later, the Russian armies met, entombing the German 6th Army. The besiegers were besieged. Hitler ordered the 6th Army not to attempt a breakout and ordered a break-in by German forces. The Luftwaffe promised to keep the German army supplied from the air. The numbers were working against the Nazis. Already the aircraft needed for Stalingrad were also needed in North Africa. The break-in was not strong enough. A grim and desperate siege began. The fighting over the coming weeks was to determine the outcome of the war in Europe. of Stalingrad in the south was mirrored by the attack on Leningrad in the north. The siege of Leningrad was not so much a siege aimed to capture the city, but a blockade deliberately designed to destroy the city and its population. The city had been encircled within weeks of the start of Operation Barbarossa. The demand on German strength to fight elsewhere meant the attackers had not the resources to overwhelm Leningrad. Hitler ordered that no surrender was to be accepted and the city and its population be destroyed by bombing, shelling, starvation, and disease. In addition to the defenders, Leningrad had a population of two and a half million civilians. The city was not completely surrounded. A slender lifeline existed across the waters of Lake Lagoda. Supplies came by this route on boat in summer, across the ice in winter. The German Navy operated motor torpedo boats and the Italian Navy midget submarines in attempts to cut this slender lifeline. By November 1941, the population was starving, eating glue, linseed oil, dead pets. There were even rumors of cannibalism. It's thought that nearly one million died in the winter of 1941 to 1942 of hunger, of disease, of cold. In the summer of 1942, heavy siege artillery was brought to bear and extra Luftwaffe planes deployed in an attempt to physically destroy the city and kill all defenders. Leningrad refused to die, refused to give in. The numbers were moving against Germany. Russian reinforcements were gradually brought to bear against the Germans in Leningrad. In early January, a Russian offensive broke through and joined up to lift the siege, 
the cracks were showing everywhere in Nazi power. It has been said that the war actually stimulated a second industrial revolution in the Soviet Union, bringing industry to new areas, to the underdeveloped east of the country, stimulating and mobilizing the exploitation of the country's vast resources. That second Russian industrial revolution was the worst of bad news for the eventual fate of the Germans. German industry was still geared to peace, and so the Germans needed to win quick and decisive victories. Until 1942, when it became clear that Russia would not be defeated quickly, Hitler had directed that the war should not alter civilian living standards. It was not until the spring of that year that Germany began to implement the changes to the economy that Britain and America had forced on their populations conscripting older men and married women into industry to release men for the armed forces, issuing directives that controlled industry, focusing upon maximum war production. The Arctic Sea convoys to the north of Russia were matched by supplies which entered through the south, through Iran, then more usually known as Persia. Ships from America would dock in southern Persian ports and convoys of trucks would carry the supplies to the Iranian-Soviet border. In August 1941, Britain and the Soviet Union invaded Iran to guarantee this supply line, effectively deposing the pro-Nazi Shah and installing his pro-Allied son. Nearly a quarter of all supplies sent to the Soviet Union during the war came by this southern route. Everywhere, the war of numbers was beginning to move against the Axis powers. In attacking Russia while simultaneously fighting America and Britain, Hitler was making assumptions upon the quality of his forces and their weapons. Hitler believed that Germany could beat superior enemies by merit of being better. Better soldiers armed with better weapons. Russia had a vast pool of manpower and space and rapidly mobilized to outproduce the Germans. By 1943, Germany was losing the war of quantity and as the war progressed was in many areas to lose that war of quality. The definitive weapon of the land was the tank. The new techniques of armored warfare defined the way World War II was fought. Russia was, in fact, to produce the best tank of the war, the T-34. It was produced in vast numbers, and along with the vast numerical advantage enjoyed by the Soviet forces, its superior performance was a key ingredient of growing Russian success. The air war in the east was, in general, fought as an adjunct to the land war. Very few raids were made by either the Axis or Soviet forces which were not made in support of ground attacks. The giant strategic bombing raids made against industrial towns were unknown. 1942 was the year in which those strategic bomber attacks began to hurt the Third Reich. Already the RAF had mounted the first 1,000 bomber raid. In August 1942, the United States Army Air Force entered the campaign, mounting its first attacks in Europe. The Battle of Britain and the Blitz had convinced the RAF that daylight raids were simply too costly to mount, and had formed the belief that nighttime raids were the only way to make attacks that would not result in heavy losses to the attackers. Precise bomb aiming was impossible at night, so the RAF made area attacks aimed at a city as a whole. The United States Air Force believed a different philosophy and equipped their B-17 flying fortresses with specialist bomb aiming equipment that enabled the bomb aimer to actually take control of the aircraft in the final approach to the target, aiming the whole plane. The bomb aimer was supposedly able to scientifically calculate all the factors that affect a bomb in freefall, such as weather and wind. 
to drop the bomb with devastating accuracy. The B-17 was known as the Flying Fortress for its formidable armament. It was a bomber that sprouted defensive machine guns at every angle. It was fast and designed to fight its way through to its target. The first U.S. raids were against targets in occupied countries where mass indiscriminate tactics of the RAF's area bombing would prove unacceptable, killing too many civilians. These first raids over France were accompanied by fighters being in range of the smaller aircraft and enjoyed some success. When in January 1943, the United States Air Force began unaccompanied raids against targets in Germany, the result was heavy losses from German fighter aircraft. At the turn of 1942 to 1943, some could now foresee the inevitable defeat of the Axis. As the year changed, the definitive turning point of the war was building to a dramatic climax at Stalingrad. All through December and January, the German 6th Army was smashed, captured inside an ever-decreasing pocket. As the perimeters collapsed and contracted, the airfields upon which Nazi defenders depended for their supply gradually fell into Russian hands. Wounded lay in the open day and night, often surrounded by a pool of frozen blood. The soldiers still fighting did so with fatalistic hopelessness. Hitler promoted 6th Army Commander General Paulus to field marshal. No German field marshal had ever surrendered. On January 31st, Paulus did surrender. The balance of strength now shifted dramatically in favor of the Russians. One hundred twenty thousand Germans had been killed, ninety thousand taken prisoner, three and a half thousand armored vehicles captured, twelve thousand guns taken, five thousand transport aircraft lost, over a thousand fighters and bombers destroyed or captured. Neither Germany's air force or Germany's army would ever recover from the losses of Stalingrad. Stalingrad's impact on the numbers of war was great, but it is the impact of the victory upon the morale and will of the German armed forces that was truly catastrophic. Nazi soldiers, many of them so young as to have been children when Hitler seized power, had come to believe that Russians were untermenschen, subhuman. Now the Aryan master race had been humiliated, the common soldiers outfought, the generals outthought. The legend of the unstoppable Blitzkrieg machine lay shattered in the rubble and snow of Stalingrad. As the horror of Stalingrad was played out, Churchill and Roosevelt met at Casablanca. They met to decide the future of the war. The leaders resolved on a war aim that would have been understood in the streets, cellars, and rubble of Stalingrad. There were to be no deals. The aim was unconditional surrender of the Axis. Next time on World War II, The Complete History, across the world, the forces of the Axis are in retreat. In North Africa, Rommel is overwhelmed by the Allies at the Battle of Kazarine Pass. The Germans are pushed into Sicily and then onto the mainland of Italy. Italy surrenders and Mussolini is deposed and imprisoned. Italy becomes another occupied country and a savagely disputed battlefield as Allied forces fight their way up the peninsula. It's a year of combined operations at Palermo, Salerno, and Anzio. At sea, the Battle of the North Atlantic turns in the Allies' favor, as the German U-boats are driven from the seas by even more powerful attacks.
In Russia, in pursuit of a decisive victory, the Germans initiate what remains as the greatest tank conflict in history, as thousands of armored vehicles wage battle at Kursk. The United States Army Air Force and Britain's Royal Air Force subject the Third Reich to incessant aerial attack by night. The sledgehammer of the RAF pounds cities to dust. By day, the surgeon's knife of the US AAF attacks the heart of the Nazi war machine. All over England, the forces of America and Britain gather in preparation for the invasion of Western Europe for D-Day.